The video you are about to watch is from an old woodworking magazine that I published during the years of 2003 to approximately 2006. This was a very unique magazine. It was purely video content and it was distributed on DVDs. The magazine ran for approximately three and a half years and then uh, due to financial concerns we simply had to terminate the magazine. We moved on to other things over the last roughly 15 years. However, there has been a request to resurrect this content, so I've gone through the trouble to get the equipment, the products, everything I needed in order to bring this content back to life to share with everyone. Here on this YouTube channel, we'll be putting up approximately 100 to 120 of the original stories that appeared in that magazine. The magazine was called Woodworking at Home Magazine, and it was truly one of a kind in the world. I really hope you enjoy these videos, and please tell your friends about them. Welcome to A Turn for the Better. I'm Dick Singh. Today we're going to kind of continue on with last issue's segment on gouges. Since then I've had a lot of inquiries on how to use grinding jigs. Do I use a grinding jig? No, I don't. I grind by hand. Would I use a grinding jig if I couldn't? You better believe I would. Next to knowing how to turn a sharp tool, well, they all go hand in hand and you do need to know how to sharpen. The main thing that a jig will give you is repeatability, which I believe is very, very necessary. Now, I've got three different jigs and one does a specific job and the others do multitudes of jobs. And I will give a little overview on what they are. I'm not going to delve into all the different tools that can be sharpened and all the different procedures, but I do think that gouges which need to be sharpened on these should have a little bit of going over. I have three jigs here. Two of them I own, one I borrowed from a friend. Uh, I would like to run through them. This is an Ellsworth grind jig. It's made specifically for his grind. Uh, it only holds his particular size gouge. It does everything that that jig is supposed to do. This is a true grind jig made by woodcut. Again, this is a multiple purpose jig. It will sharpen gouges to various grinds. It's made to sharpen skews, scrapers, everything else without any additions. This is the Wolverine jig that's made by One Way, and it will sharpen a multitude of different tools, but you need accessories to adapt them. My basic grinding setup, I'm one of those people that have to make things to suit me. Okay, my originally, this would not have been in here, which would have given me the option of bending over. And I don't care to do that. I prefer to have my grinder up where it works for me. So I just made a, a, a riser. If you do that, make sure you have a solid base so you don't get it so high it becomes wobbly or tippy and, and cause you problems in that respect. As far as the the table for the grinder. All three grinding jigs give you explicit instructions on how to set it up. And all three basically come out close. I'm talking within a quarter of an inch or so. Okay, how did I go about it? I know everybody reads the instructions, but reading and doing are two different options. To begin with, I took a a square and from my leading edge I determined where I wanted my grinder to be. So I took and drew a center line all the way across my piece. Grinder was not on it. Nothing was, just the board. I took my end caps off, found the center of the axles or the axle shaft. I determined with that square that they were centered on my center line. 
I also had to figure my height from either the jig or the table. Again, I used my square. When I de determined what I needed for a shim under my grinder to reach that proper height, I made a shim and positioned it. Again, keeping everything square to that center line, I mounted my grinder to that block. As far as the two different grinding jigs, I took a scale and found the center of my wheel, which I drew a line down and mounted both of my pieces so that they were centered under the wheels. This is the very grind jig for the Wolverine sharpening system. One of the problems that I see with it, and is easily correctable, the leg seems to have been cut with a plasma cutter. This leaves sharp edges down on the very end where it goes down into your arm to hold it. I go ahead and radius that end off so that when it's setting in here, everything works smoothly rather than ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk over the corners. And you definitely want it to work as smooth as you can to get a good grind. As I stated before, I never seem to leave anything alone. I have to modify it to suit myself. This particular grind on the, or jig on the true grind had a, a knob on here. On the handle it had a wing nut, which I found inconvenient. I've replaced them with adjustable locking handles just so I had the ability to take and, and move things a little easier. They're available from woodworking stores and industrial supplies. A dollar here may just take and make everything much easier for yourself. Grinding a tool by hand is kind of complex, actually. I'm going to just put a normal bowl grind on one, not the long Ellsworth or ears pulled real far back. But I'd like you to see the motions that a body has to go through to do that. I like to use my hand as a support, bring up my tool, We want it as fast and free as we can. Normally I use a tool rest. I don't have it with me right now, so I'm just doing it freehand. To make the Ellsworth jig grind properly, you have to use his dimensions. He gives you dimensions to build a jig out of wood or to take and utilize a Wolverine jig with the addition of a block. Now David's dimensions are from the axle to his jig four inches, from the face of the wheel to the back of his jig seven inches, from the tip of the gouge to the end of the jig two inches. So we'll utilize this little block, set up our dimensions, and we have his jig that lays perfectly on that wheel. It will give you that every time. Now the only alterations, as your wheel decreases in size, you may have to alter your, your distance on the length. Or you can always take and bring it in and set your angle on the wheel on the very end of your gouge. That will do the same thing. Setting up either the true grind or the vera grind jigs are basically the same. I often see someone with a big cheek ground out of the side of their bowl gouge and I ask them why do they have that big flat cheek on there and it's be they tell me it's because that's the dimensions that they gave me. If they read closer, 
they would see that it says that the dimensions are a good starting point. Normally, it's anywhere from inch and three quarter to two inch. It could be an inch and a half. It could be whatever. Whatever suits you. I like two inches. As I showed you before, you can use a scale or you can take a block of wood and drill, say, with a Fossner bit, which will give you a flat bottom. And that will automatically set you at your two inches. Now, some people put a hole in a workbench or anywhere. I don't like holes in my workbench, so I just make a little adapter. Okay, that's the start. I've set it at two inches. If I want to maintain this cutting edge that I have here, number one, I have to bring back my, my slide until I match the end of that tool. Now, nobody says that I cannot check this with the grinder stopped. When I check this particular grind with the grinder stopped, I'm not even coming close to the end of the tool here on the wing. So what does that tell me? It tells me to pull the wings back further, I have to spread my, my arm forward. I was back almost parallel with the tool. Now, once I do that, I've changed the geometry again. Now I have to reset my, my angle on the tip of my gouge. I'll roll this over, and lo and behold, I'm right about where I hand ground this one. I've locked everything down. My slide is locked. My jig is locked. Present it, and just start rolling it. One of the things that I find, people really don't look at what they grind. I've got a little spot right in here that's still shiny, that hasn't been sharpened. Now, that doesn't mean I have to sharpen the whole tool if, if it's not needed. I'll just sharpen that spot. As long as I keep my cutting edge in a nice radius with no hooks, no flat spots, just what I need to make a nice, smooth, clean cut. Right on the tip, I have a shiny spot. That shiny spot means that there's no edge there. You can't see an edge, but you can see the shiny spot. Looking pretty darn good. And what I'm going to do right now is start from one side and lightly make a nice, smooth, even pass. I've got a nice grind. One of the things you want to make sure you do is keep that in the, in the pocket. Always keep a little pressure back on both, both kinds of jigs as that, that determines where everything is. If you allow it to come forward, you're going to change everything. If you allow it to pop out of there, you're liable to take and, and create a problem again. This is now a slight radius down. The other side is almost equal. They converge at the bottom and make a very nice radius. 
that jig will produce a very nice grind. As you notice, I have no cheek. Everything just blends up into an even line at the end of the ear. This makes this area much stronger rather than carrying this width all the way over to here, which is what I mean by a cheek. Here's our finished grind. Now when I took and set this jig, when I adjusted the leg, what I did was pulled this ear back. Now with the Ellsworth jig that is fixed, if you'll notice how long this ear is, and also look at the angle between the arms. Now, if I wanted to make this grind with this jig, or even with this one, what I have to do is loosen and bring this jig arm forward, which will take and present a much greater roll, which will bring this back farther. If you keep this parallel with the shaft, all it will do is give you just a normal grind. So it all depends on where you take and pull that leg to establish your grind. The distance, it can, be, it can alternate, except once you establish your grind, do not change that. Stay with that length. You can take and do different tools with different lengths, but if you alter the length of that protrusion, it's going to change the geometry again of your, your tool. Now, if you wanted to take and say that you've established a jig or a tool that you wanted on this jig. Take an awl and scribe it so you can come back to it. You could grind another tool with a different jig or a different angle. You could even grind a tool with a different angle and a different protrusion. But establish, even on a piece of paper, somewhere where you're going to remember, set that protrusion what that angle is and what the angle of your tip is and you can repeat it on this particular jig they have notches to help you uh, nobody says you have to stay within that notch you can still change and do whatever you want you don't have to take and use these particular notches if the shape of the tool that you want is between two notches no problem. Just do what you have to do to make the tool grind that you want. Okay, I have three different grinds here right now. On this particular grind is on a 3 8 spindle gouge. You'll notice it's done in a, a fingernail shape and very nicely. This 5 8 bowl gouge is done with the Ellsworth or the Irish grind. It all depends how you want to call it, but this is done on Ellsworth jig. Again, a very nice grind. This is a 5 8 bowl gouge done with the traditional grind. Looks quite fine. Here are the three jigs that ground these three tools. The spindle gouge, our traditional bowl gouge, and our Ellsworth grind. Now the point I want to make, if you look at the foot, the angle of the foot in relation to the position of the chisel, this one is very severe, which means it has to roll quite a bit. That's what pulls back this wing so far. This pulls back the wing very little. This one pulls it back just a little more. So the main thing I'm trying to get across is utilize that foot to get what you need.
I'd like to do a little bit of a wrap up on my feelings on these jigs. This is the Ellsworth jig. It produces a single grind on a single tool. And that's not all bad. That's what it was meant to do. It's a fine tool. This is again the Wolverine jig with the very grind attachment. I also have there a table which I like. Now myself, I again have altered it. I've cut a notch in it so I could get the table closer to the wheel so I'm not left out in the open on some of my little grinds. It also has numerous jigs available that work off of this for grinding skews, whatever. Is it good? You believe it. Uh, it'll do you a multitude of things. This is the True Grind. Uh, very, very good tool. Made in New Zealand. I like the, the slide. The compactness of it is neat. I don't like the long arm of the Wolverine that sometimes gets caught on things for me. It has a multitude of other purposes that I'm not going to get into at this time because we're talking about gouges. Which would I buy? I would be torn. As you can see, I'm a tool junkie. I've got two. Um, I think it all boils down to what you want to do. How much you turn. Um, probably this one's a little cheaper on count of its doesn't have all the accessories that say the Wolverine does. Is one any better than the other? I don't think so. They all do the thing. The main, the main ingredient in all these jigs are that you have to think. Now the Ellsworth and the Wolverine, you can buy those just about anywhere. This particular one, the only place that I know that it's available is Craft Supplies USA. As long as we're talking grinding jigs, I think we better talk about wheels because someone's going to ask me, what grit do we need? I think the wheel grit should be in relation to what you are doing. This particular grinder, I have an, a 60 on the one side and I have 80 on the other. Uh, mainly because I use it for bowl gouges, um, heavy things. My grinder that I use every day I have a hundred and an eighty. And the reason I do that is I use much smaller tools most of the time. If I use the 60 grit wheel and a quarter inch gouge, it leaves almost a serrated edge, which I don't want. Uh, main thing, have a friable wheel. Friable means it's made for high speed steel where it's not a bonded wheel that will glaze. This will break down easily and keep you a clean surface for grit. You definitely need a diamond dresser of some kind or a decent dresser to keep your wheels in good shape. One other little factor, people see me dip my tool in water and say that's no good. High speed steel, you have to be pretty mean to it before you lose all its properties. Now if you're car grinding carbon steel you cannot afford to burn it or blue it. If you're grinding and you do get your tool hot, don't get it so hot that when you put it in the water that it would get hairline fractures. If you can't touch it, lay it down for a little bit before you cool it. Then you won't have any problems. As far as the Grinding goes, you grind your tool once, then you sharpen it. There's no sense in grinding that tool and changing everything every time. If you set things up properly, you use your head, make that everything what it's supposed to be. Grind it once, get it to the shape you want it, then take and sharpen it. Today we've kind of gone through the jigs and we haven't even scratched the surface of grinding. It's a delicate operation and the only way you learn is by doing. We set some parameters, kind of gave you ideas of where to go with it. From here on, it's on your shoulders. You're going to have to carry it. 
few tips. Before you turn that grinder on, roll that jig over. Make sure that that tool is going into the position that you really want it to. Don't grind the tool away making mistakes. Stop, look, think. The jigs will do whatever you want them to. You have to take and make them do what you want them to do. I'm Dick Singh, and the jig is up. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you truly enjoyed it, please help us share this information with the rest of the communities. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a big thumbs up, and be sure to tell your friends about this channel. Thanks again for watching.